three, four, five, six, seven. Time's up. Please stop. Time to see the characters. Eleven. Twelve. Sorry. Thirteen. Fourteen. Okay. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Andrew Siang. Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Lionel Yung, and we are both from Concept First. Now today we'll be sharing with you some practical tips and how best to ace your practical exam. Now earlier on, Mr. Yong, yes. why was it that at the 55 minutes I was still doing my experiment that you took the apparatus away? I thought that we had one hour 50 minutes for the entire experiment. You are actually right, Mr. Siang. We do have a one hour 50 minutes. So for pure physics, the 1 hour 50 minutes duration is actually for the entire experiment which is split into two sections, section A and section B. So for each section, you are only allocated 55 minutes per section. Oh, I see. So at the end of each section, you are supposed to stop whatever you're doing. Your apparatus would be taken away and you are to move on to the next set of apparatus. And on the actual day itself, you wouldn't know whether you are doing section A or section B first. So you will only be able to find out on that day itself. Alright, for combined physics, it's slightly different because students, you have 1 hour 30 minutes for the entire experiment. But that includes both the chemistry component as well as the physics component. So, in this 1 hour 30 minutes, you have access to both types of setup, whether chemistry or physics. And you are supposed to allocate your time accordingly. So you can actually spend more than half the time on, let's say, physics or half, more than half the time on chemistry. Now there'll be one to two compulsory experiments from each of the two sciences and each of them will be 15 marks each. So Mrs. Jia, what do you think students should bring to the practical examination? Okay, first of all you need your calculator because there are surely a lot of calculations Bring also a 30cm transparent ruler. It is good for drawing your basket, especially when it's transparent because you can see the data points easily. Also bring your protractor, set squares and compasses. Sometimes you are required to draw a basket curve. In that case, you need an adjustable curve or French curve. Of course, you need to bring your pen, pencil and eraser. These are the basic essentials. Finally, remember to bring your IC and entry proof as you require these documents to even enter the examination hall. Okay, Mr. Yong, in the event that we are unable to get any data points or even set up the experiment, should I ask the invigilator for help? Okay, so first and foremost, the apparatus, you must always check whether it is faulty or not when you do the experiment. So in the event that it's faulty, you must report it, okay? So second point I want to touch on is, if you ask the invigilator for help, that request will be recorded and marks will be deducted unless your equipment is faulty. However, if you are unable to get data sets or raw measurements for 10 minutes or so, we suggest that students ask the invigilator for help because it's better to get some points and some marks for your graph and table rather than nothing. Okay, here are some do's and don'ts. So number one, always read the question carefully. And as you do so, do not treat it like a bedtime story. You are supposed to visualize what is happening. Underline the keywords, which you think you may forget later. Now these keywords can include things like precision, how many DP you should store your data to, and things like that. Next, when you take readings, do them carefully. A few careful and precise readings is always better than many inaccurate ones. Now, even if time constrained, get your graph drawn. Because if you don't get your graph drawn, you will lose the entire marks for that component. Now, do not dismantle your setup because there are times when you need to take extra readings. So leave your setup undismantled until the question is completely done. Okay, in practical, there are a few skill sets that you'll be tested on. The first one is on manipulation, measurement and observation. 
Now, many students don't really know how to store their data. So you need to know this thing called precision. So precision is basically the smallest unit that an instrument can measure. Okay, and we have two types of instruments. The first one, you will store the measurement to the smallest division. Whereas for the second one, you will store it to half the smallest division. For our CF students, you can actually refer to our CF practical menu. All of this have been compiled nicely for you. Let's move on to the next part. All right, the next part is how to process raw data. Now to process raw data means to calculate. And raw data means any value or any measurement you make using an instrument. So there are two things that we follow in general. Number one is called your DP rule and the other is called the SF rule. Now for DP rule, very simple. You use it when you're adding, subtracting or averaging raw data. That means the final answer will be rounded off to the same decimal points or places as the raw data with the least number of DP. So examples are given here, addition, subtraction and average. Let's just look at one. So for subtraction, let's say you have one DP on the first term, minus another raw data or measured value with two DP, then your final answer has to follow the one with the least DP. So it will end up with one DP. Okay, the other rule is called the SF rule. You use it when you are multiplying, dividing, squaring, or dividing by a number n, which is a constant and not a measured value, or when you're using a reciprocal. Now, in all of these cases, you always follow the lowest SF. What it means is that you follow the significant figure of the term that has the lowest SF. Example, this term 2SF, this term 3. So the final answer will be 2SF simply because we are doing a multiplication. Now, always remember never to leave your final answers in fractions or recurring numbers because this will suggest that your instrument was infinitely precise, and that cannot be true. Okay, so for the next segment, we will touch on the TRAP framework. T-R-A-P. So what does it stand for? T stands for table or trend. So what we are looking for is the correct table headers with the appropriate units. For trend, we are looking for the independent variable for example, L in cm or meters, when L increases, the process data, which is the dependent variable, for example, T squared, should either increase or decrease. Next, we will look at the range. So the range of the independent variable must be at least half of the maximum possible range. So let me give you an example. So in this experiment, L is from 0 to 100 cm. We are using a meter rule here. So half the maximum range is minimum of 50 cm and that should be within your data set. The next thing we look for is accuracy A. So accuracy is how close your raw data is to the teacher's raw data. That is something you cannot control. So the best way to score for that point is to perform good experimental technique. So the last letter P stands for precision and is to make sure that your raw data and your process data follows the DP and SF rules. What do I mean? Looking at the example table, our values for T1 and T2 follows that of the raw data. So you can see they are of 1 DP. Similarly, our T average data, which is our process data, will follow the smallest or lowest dp of our raw data. In this case, 1 dp as well. Likewise, for our period capital T, it is taking the average data, which is T average, dividing by a fixed number, 40 oscillations, and obtaining this value. Now, because it follows the lowest SF in our T average, which is 3 SF. And this is the same for the case of T-squared as well. Okay, moving on, Mr. Xiao will next talk about the graph segment, which is another important section that you should be paying attention. Okay, we have a framework to plot graph. It is called ASPB, 
And a simple way to memorize that is all Singaporean play balls. So the A stands for axis. So for your axis, you always need to make sure you have the physical quantity and place a slash, whatever comes behind a slash will be labeled as the units. Then the dependent variable is often plotted on the vertical axis. The independent variable is plotted along the horizontal axis. Now ensure that the points where your x and y axis meet is well labeled. This might not have to be the origin. In fact, you're expected to not start from the origin so that you can maximize the range. Next, in order to maximize your skill, you have to start the x and y axis along the edge of the graph paper. S stands for skill. So what it means is that the first to the last plotted point needs to take up at least more than half of the given graph paper. Now you need to also label every large square and when you label the large square, make sure the precision is to half the smallest square. Correct it to 1SF. Next, the scale should be easy to read. An example is the Singapore dollar denomination. So every 2cm or every big square is supposed to represent 1 unit, 2 unit, 5 unit. Of course, it can also represent 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500 and so on. Number three is your points. So points should be marked using small fine crosses. Each data point again should be plotted precise to half the smaller square, correct to 1SF. Now for a straight line graph, you'll need at least six readings, but for a curve, you need eight readings, unless you're otherwise instructed. Now, if you have an anomaly, which is the point as an outlier, what you can do is actually to repeat the experiment. So our advice is never to dismantle your setup until you're done with the entire experiment. This way you can quickly take a new reading. However, if after taking new readings you find that you still have an anomaly, what you can do is to circle that point. And that means you're asking the examiner to sort of ignore it or you recognize it as an anomaly. Next. B stands for best fit line, and this can either be a straight line or a curve. Now this line represents the average of all your data points. So every data collection will always involve some kind of random mistake. So the average serves to reduce this random mistake. Next, there should be roughly the same number of points above and below your best fit line. Finally, do not join the points from one to the other as though it's a kindergarten daughter book. So one good example is this one here. Straight away, you can notice that it's a straight line. Now this line only happens to pass through two of the points, that's fine. But there are equal number of points below and above the line. Okay, this is an example of a good graph. So number one, make sure you have a title, Y against X. And also your axis should be well labeled and the units always come behind the slash. Now a very important piece of information that students often grapple with is how do we label these skills? To what precision? Do we follow the table? The answer is no. What you should be following is actually a precision to half the smaller square on your graph. Let me show you an example. This is your x-axis and you have chosen the scale 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So every big square represents 0 0.1, meaning 10 more small squares, sorry, Meaning 10 small squares represent 0.1. So one square will represent 0.01 and half a square will represent 0.005. Therefore, that is 3DP, meaning that you should label all of this to 3DP. Now there comes a tricky case. What if 10 small squares represent 0.5 units? Then one square will be 0.05. And then half square will be 0.025. Now, because this has something to do with uncertainty, which you will learn in JC, you should convert the precision of half the smaller square to just one SF. That will be 0.03. And now you take note that this is actually 2DP, meaning you should store all your x-axis value to 2DP if 10 squares represent 0.5. Okay, the next part is graph analysis. So one very important thing you're asked to do very often is to find the gradient. So to find the gradient of a straight line, you need to first draw a right angle triangle such that the hypotenuse is at least more than half the length of your best fit line. This just means they have to be far apart. So the two chosen points you choose, however, far apart, 
must still be within the first and last data set. And the coordinates labeled must be to half the smaller square, correct to one SF. Now, gradient is very special. You do not have to follow the SF or DP rule. In fact, the final answer is just left to two or three SF. Next, gradient does not need to have a unit. However, when you're asked to find a physical quantity that is obtained or represented by the gradient, because it's a physical quantity, it must have the units. So one example is this. If you just calculate gradient and you find that the gradient is 840, but because it was a distance time graph, and you know that the formula is distance is p times time plus some constant, then the constant s, which represents speed and is given by the gradient, should have a unit because after all, it represents speed. Next, you are also often asked to determine the y-intercept and there are two ways to do so. Number one, you can read directly off the graph if the y-intercept happens to be obtainable from the graph. However, in most cases, when we maximize the skill, we often are not able to see the y-intercept. In that case, you can calculate using the formula of the straight line. So both methods work, and the key underlying point is that you should not sacrifice your skill just to ensure you can read off the y-intercept.